Okay, it looks like we are live. Uh, there we go. Hi, I'm Sarithkin. I'm up in Ontier, and I am here tonight as part of my um, quest to interview 50 Dukes with uh, His Grace, um, Duke James Greyhelm, who reigned eight times in the West. Is that right? Um, so, yes. and he is the most senior Duke still fighting. Correct? You're cutting out, but I think you asked if I was the most senior fighter. And I think the only one who'd fought longer than I had was Duke Frederick of Holland, because he was at the last West Ontario War. He told me that he had uh, stopped fighting. Yeah, and I just talked to him earlier this week. And, he, and, and so that, no, yeah, nobody, uh, nobody who, came up with me as people who are close to my age still fights so i guess i must be it um one um, on the east kingdom who who's been around you know at least as long but i started fighting in 58 so um Yay. go ahead oh 68 oh yeah okay that's what i wanted to make see and you were knighted in 1971, is that right? You, you cut out again, so I, I couldn't hear you. Um, you were knighted in 1971. Um, were you squired to anyone? I was, I was Scott Hodor, who has uh, long left the planet. Uh, king in I think he won September Crown in, in AS. So he uh, he was king when I was a brand new squire, and, and I you, didn't realize. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Um, did you win crown the same day that you were knighted? I didn't hear the whole question. Oh, I'm I, sorry. Um, did you win crown the same day you were knighted? No, no, I knighted at uh, Beltane by King Hagen the Strong. And, and I I had, um, I had, the most I'd ever done was like three rounds in, in a crown tournament. But I guess they saw something in me that I didn't because I went out and won the next crown. So I went knighting the newly knighted uh, Sir Paul of Bellatrix in the finals. It went three fights, and we were all, it was back before we had any armor, so I was pretty much hammered. You know, all, all we had were helmets, and a few people had some padding, uh, had some armor of some sort. That was about it. Most of the armor was... Uh, It, it, nobody had gear that would pass uh, an inspection now. Right. And was that a sword and shield final? Um, was he, see. Pardon? Uh, was that your first crown sword and shield? It was. And Paul and I traded the throne for the next two years. Um, he's Paul, James Paul. And it was, uh, and then and I took, and so I didn't fight in the next tournament I was eligible for, and who should win? But Henrik, who'd been king already more than anyone, that was Duke Henrik of Hahn. So uh, that was kind of funny, actually. So the West just had like three kings for three um, years. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, um, it we established a lot of the customs for the. West Kingdom and, and Frontier, and for Kaid, it was all one big kingdom at that point. And his uh, first or second reign drove up I-5 and created the first baronies. And uh, Brianna and I established some of the rules of combat, like the at the knee and below. If you got hit in the thigh, at least, you know, it didn't cripple you. But if you got hit in the knee or the shin, it might send you 
into a hospital or because the, uh, there just wasn't any armor. And it was certainly, I mean, most people didn't even have knee pads. Um, we probably, we were capable of hitting just as hard then as we hit. Uh, it seems to me, even though the tournaments were very small, maybe be 20 to, uh, somebody went to the hospital on a regular basis. Um, my first, I, I had a, a broken thumb and a broken arm. Um, so first year in, when I was a 16-year-old kid and I weighed maybe 122 pounds, or something like that. It was pretty ribs in that, uh, in, in practically my first year in the SCA. So it was really dangerous. <laughs> we learned quickly to, to uh, build and we, uh, by AS5, we had pretty good gear. Most of us. Um, the Freon can helmets, the original ones were 12 gauge steel. They were were bulletproof round and the space between the front and back wasn't very good and so the foreheads split open by those things that they took a hard shot to the head coming in uh there was no because nobody had body armor really except for uh, duke siegfried and, and duke henrik had some pretty decent body armor um really most people didn't and a thrust probably could have killed somebody so he didn't have really have spears uh made it a, a lot hey i can't call it safe um but people got knocked out on a rig you know i did you know in the, in the early days because you get hit from behind in melees you know i'm fighting somebody and somebody walk up behind me and hit me in the back and you know put my lights out it was uh william gordon of york did that doesn't sound fun. I remember. It, was, uh, <laughs> it was not um, that part, but all the other things were fun. I mean, it hasn't changed. It's still, it's still based on personal relationships and how many people can you know? How many people do you hang with? So what, what has changed is that households were much more, more important back then. There were households in the West Kingdom that um, most of us were pretty poor. So they would events and people would pool um, driving and cooking and so uh, those large early households were really important. What but, were some? Uh, I know there's still some of that too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was going to ask, what were some of the customs that you implemented during your early reigns? Hmm. Well, I created um, counts and earls. Uh, Brian and I um, set that up after my, my second reign. We uh, decided that somebody who'd been king once could be a count or an earl. And had countesses. So, um, gee, and at this point, you know, a lot of this, so I don't remember a whole lot of it, a lot of the details. Um, and also, let's be honest, I've been hit on the head a lot. Well, creating counts and countesses is a, is a pretty big deal. I mean, that that's a big one. Um, um, you know, there were various awards. We just, we have the idea that the king's word was law, that sort of thing. Um, that um, famous, notorious, I don't know, whatever incident. And when I was, I, uh, somebody did something I didn't like, and I basically used voice of command And, and put them in their place. And Catherine Kurtz saw that and, and 
used it as this, so it was it was pretty cool. But uh, realistically, the group was there for the most part, and, and even if you didn't get along with somebody, you had to interact with them because it was so small. So there was uh, there was no anonymity uh, when I joined the SCA. There were probably only about who were active and you could you could have people in a small backyard so because i did that how big were the so, crown attorneys back then pardon how big were the crown attorneys back then 20 or 30 people smaller they were uh, and a lot of them were single limb um it was probably AS four or five before we started having regular double elimination tournaments. Um, you know, it was, uh, you could fight, I don't know, five or six fights and you were king. Um, if, if the finals went two out of three, then you might fight eight fights. Uh, even so, it was tense. The, you know, a lot of the fighters were, were very good even back then uh and as a new fighter i was fighting people who'd had three years i had say from an as6 because they've been fighting since as1 but even who stopped playing uh for various reasons um probably injury was part of it so the group evolved quickly um i joined at the World's in Berkeley in Labor Day weekend of uh, 1968. And I saw the SCA for the first time. And um, um, Marion uh, moved out to New York, and so the East Kingdom was getting going. And uh, oh, LA, Kaid started to happen. Uh, it was starting to, to spread rapidly. Aitenveld got going very quickly. Little Kingdom, East Kingdom, Aitenveld, Kaid West, and then a little bit later on tier. They're really way around the country. That was a slow process, still going on. What were the first Inner, inner Kingdom Wars? Hmm. Um, the Pensick War may have been the first one, and the origins of that are pretty famous wars early on that were pretty fun. Um, and times, and then uh, Aidenveld. Let me uh, close these blinds behind me here. It's really distracting. I'll be right back. There. Um, the uh, down in Aitenfeld were, were the Burl Creek Wars. And in one of those wars, um, King of the West. And we really had a lot of fun at the Burl Creek Wars, but we outgrew the site. The next two wars were fought at. Uh, uh, sandbox. Yeah, I think they were called the Kitty Litter Wars or Sandbox Wars or something like that. They were pretty awful. And that uh, Kirby DeWise had bought out in the out near Quartzsite, Arizona. And it was a miserable site. I stopped going after those wars because there just seemed to be a lot of people not counting blows, you know. And so uh, it was some of the problems you get with Inner Kingdom War. Or people's tempers get. Uh, I love the West Ontario War because that's that's always pretty good. People get along pretty well. We all know each other. But uh, I've only been to 
one Penzik, I know, um, I can't really speak to things like Lily's War and Gulf, Gulf War. I've heard good things. Uh, I've never been. So. so we were talking a little bit before we went um, live about um, your extended household and how many dukes are in your household. How many squires have you had? Not that many. Um, so. 15 over the years. Uh, I usually only had one or two squires at a time. Of those squires, uh, many of them got knighted or uh, But one of my squires was Jade. And Jade, of course, had a lot of squires and around the world. And through him, I, I'm, that was like three or four years ago. We counted up the number one by knights of my lineage, and it was over a hundred. So, and there's somebody who's keeping it. It's uh, the the kind of uh, head that does most of the work with that now is is the uh, is Uther, you know, king of the. West right now on, on due to the COVID-19 thing. And he, uh, he's new, but I've had, let's see, um, Jade, Count Daniel, Terrence, they've all won crowns, so they were my squires. Um, Terrence and Jade became dukes. I heard Ben's fight, who knows, he could take one. Um, he was a grand fighter in his day. And, oh geez, I've had some, some really good squares. I've still got some really good squares. Um, but at some point here, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm actually going to have, have to retire from fighting. And this year is not that year, but uh, I've been fighting, you know, coming up on 52 years. It's, uh, it's taken some wear and tear on my body. I, I will say that. I started doing equipment back in the 70s and never really got into it heavily because I didn't have a horse. I was recently in the Outlands and I got really involved in the equestrian work there. Um, here with Sir William Brennan and, and uh, I went out to uh, Barony of Kirtha. They were just starting in equestrian and people were far better riders than, than I was. I mean, they did rodeo riding and things like, like that, but they're fighting and they didn't know how to handle the weapons and things. So I built them a quintain and, and, and we got go to uh, equestrian activity. And I had a blast with those people. I really, really enjoyed it. Involved when I came out here, but um, mundane life has uh, kept me from doing it. And I realize I'm old, and as a semi-retired school teacher, um, I don't have the extra income. I mean, I need to have a horse. I keep riding so that I could uh, continue doing martial activities after I release anymore. But uh, I, I think that is is not to be. But I can still train people to stuff about how to train fighters. So. Um, I think I'm good at it, so I uh, I will continue to fight until it becomes me to do it. I even fought in a coronet tournament here uh, in, back in March. I had a lot of didn't went out and you know like five rounds, but hey, I had fun. You fought in Summit's coronet or Summit's coronet? I missed the second part of your statement, but I fought in Summit's coronet. That, that's all I was asking. That, that's cool. Yeah, no, well, he took me out of the. Oh, yeah, it was great. We had a great fight. Two fights. They were wonderful. What is your training um, methodology? Uh, oh, that's a great question. And I've been thinking 
about that going up. When I was really serious about training for crowns and training people for crowns, it was to fight for an hour and a half to two hours solid. Uh, the best, the best training I did was we would have, uh, we would just rotate in, uh, two in, one out, two in, one out, and taking breaks so that we could develop our endurance, and we would critique each other. There's fights. Uh, video was very easy at all. You had to have a movie camera or something, so we didn't. We had to look at each other and we come any way to really see our own fighting and the other thing we did was physical conditioning and earlier i was a pretty small guy i was uh, about i was the height that i am now i was like five but uh i only weighed about 120 pounds when i started fighting and uh up to um my best fighting weight was around 150 And I'm, I'm seven years and uh, just physically working out, adding, adding what helped me. And, but because I was so small when I was learning to fight, or by using my uh, legs and my torso, and I listened to people early on about, you know, generating power through your legs and your back. And I applied that, and almost everybody was just um, using their arms. There, there really wasn't much else going on. And uh, serious thought into it. And mundanely, I studied physics. So I, I was at, at Cal, and I thought about the physics of fighting and the physics of armor. And the physics of, realized that there was some fairly easy ways to determine the point of Percussion of a sword that's and so I worked through that and I was able to generate a lot of power with my board really large and 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 also um, I had two other major is obvious I'm left-handed anybody's watched me fight knows I'm you know left-handed um, the other was though that I was fast um, I was faster than than most of the other guys in before, before they could. And so that helped too. Is that where you got the nickname, the gray ghost? Was it your speed? Would you repeat that question? I couldn't get it. So I was told your nickname was the gray ghost. Is, is, did you get that nickname because of your speed or have you never heard that? I've never. So, uh, it, if that's, True, that's news to me. I was fast. I was once told, I think it was bogus, but I was once told uh, by the guys who did RuneQuest that the, uh, the reason that RuneQuest players who had higher dexterity got to hit first, if in fact that's even true, was because of me. The guy told me that, but who knows? He could have been drinking. Um, But, and, um, heck, uh, I was in the finals ghost because I lost the finals five times. <laughs> um, I was in, I was in the crown finals and I, uh, I've won two coronets as well. So that's full career. Definitely. Um, I know you were Prince of the Summits in the 90s. Um, where else were you Prince? Boy. I was Prince of the Summits and Prince of the Mists. Okay. And was the Mists that was it. Um, like early days? No. It was it's, uh, well, late 80s or early 90s. I could look it up. So that's a, that's a long time ago for a you don't need to look it up. <laughs> That's what three, it was. It's it's not the real early days of the SCA though. So you've rained a lot. What's your favorite part One of thing, real early? Mm. Oh oh. Um, 
giving laurels and pelicans and knighting, recognizing excellence. And uh, about being king is to uh, that are theatrical and, and bring us together and, and generate the, uh, the that we think is the Middle Ages. I mean, our view of the Middle Ages is filtered through many lenses. Uh, 1950s TV shows like Robin Hood, um, 1950s and 40s medieval movies, uh, the Boy Scouts had a uh, chivalric tone to them in their early days that uh, permeate culture. Uh, you, there's a wonderful book um, called Return to Camelot. The um, 1800s and early 1900s in England, and there, if you'd ask, according to this book, if you'd ask somebody in England in, say, 17... I don't know, seven talking about. But when um, Sir Walter Scott starts writing medieval books, uh, this medieval culture developed. And by the 1840s, it had actually had a tournament in armor with jousting. In, um, it's, it's a famous Eglinton tournament, uh, it's a novel about it, or actually a, a historical about it called The Knight and the Umbrella. Um, it became very political, uh, and, it, and it looked really cool. You know, the, the first day it rained like heck, and the pavilions all leaked and everything, so most people were nice, and they had some pretty good fighting. Um, Victoria and Albert had a medieval ball. This was, that's how, how the Middle Ages came back to England. And, and I have a minute for sure that somebody in the American South tried to hold a tournament. I, don't know if it's true, dueling and stuff on a regular basis. I mean, one of my ancestors tried to have a, two duels with uh, Andrew Jackson, tried to kill him twice. Um, oh, well, that would have changed. Um, he hated Jackson. So um, they, uh, they actually had to be physically uh, That That line of my family is interesting. If you go back far enough, I have have an ancestor who was in uh, Don Juan de Xavier. So uh, that is interesting. Who knows? I mean, I mean, you know, some weird, weird geneticism. Yeah, having a famous ancestor in three bucks get you a cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, so you're also a laurel and a pelican. What were you laureled for? Pelican for uh, running my my then wife. Duchess Farina of Laurel Land, we autocratted every crown event for a year. We were Worcester, and uh, we got a pelican at the end of that year, which did. Um, I got my, my Laurel for armoring. I was one of the first commercial armorers. Um, one of them, and I was making some of the first uh, bassinet and uh, there's a there is a transcribed um, eight millimeter from sometime in the uh, late 70s or early 80s wearing Freon cans and great helms but there's one guy with a bassinet and that's me so actually uh, be legal now so it was uh Somebody pointed that out to me. I thought, yeah, it looks pretty good. So, but uh, armoring advanced because people wanted to be authentic. They wanted to have good gear. They wanted to look the part. Um, we were the magic and, and the romance of the Middle Ages. And, you know, it's really hard, hard to do that if you're wearing a sleeping bag that's been split into legs for armor in a Freon can. Um, I, I, uh, 
My first helmet was made from a teardrop shaped fender mounted and headlight off a two gauge steel with a face plate made from a fencing mask. I could always tell when I'd been hit because I had to, so it was really easy to see what was going on there. I still got it. So crazy stuff. Do you, do you still um, fight an armor that you've made? Yeah, I still fight in my own armor. I still have all my tools. I can still make armor. Um, I was to make armor and, you know, go to events and enjoy life. But uh, Monday and I'm back teaching. Uh, so I had to put that off for a couple of years. Um, you know, the very old days, you'd ask me about swords and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, and I have an artifact. Here, let me hand, get it. Yeah. This is a rattan sword from about 1971. I had this sword from the time I was, it was my only sword, and it was a sword that I fought with from when I was a squire. And it's still actually usable. If I wanted to, uh, you can see that I have not restored it in any way, but I um, to show people how I put a sword together. Um, I would knife, and you can see that it's wider this way than it is this way. I would take a draw knife and plane it flat so that I could clearly tell where my edges were. Then I would spiral wrap it with and then wrap it with duct tape the very early swords had no tape on them they painted silver and they broke all the time um, um now but it used to happen every tournament and unlike a lot of people now i use a heavy steel old basket hill that I will have some balance to the sword. Everybody who get, ever gets the chance should have a period sword. They handle beautifully. Their balance is spectacular. And right there. So about, and virtually every period sword I've handled, except for rapiers, balance and that same. So having the weight down near your hand actually makes the sword handle more like a period, like a period sword. You've got to have a pommel and a cross for the good gauntlets. Um, most of our injuries in the early days were to the hand, made first basket hilts, and as soon as I learned to weld, I made one for myself. Um, the plastic hilts, the, the weight of the sword, I think, is too far forward, and they don't handle like a sword. Um, but if we're trying to recreate something, we should try to recreate it at least halfway decent. And I'm not an authenticity um, fanatic in, in, in any way. However, I think that where we can, we should try to be more authentic rather than less. So at one point, looked into trying to get some whalebone uh, from Alaska to make an actual sword because they made them out of parchment-covered whalebone uh, in the King Rene book. But uh, it was prohibitively expensive, and um, consciousness about hey, you know, whales may be sentient. Let's not be killing them. So. Oh, I decided I would throw on it. So, so do you do you use a um, lanyard with that? There's no trigger, right? Yes. Yeah. Not 
I triggered though, just to me, just keep it from flying out of my hand. Uh, you know, was just sometimes a sword or a mace would go flying off into the crowd and people would have to dodge it. So we figured we'd better do something. Um, and we made a rule about it. You know, it was just a good idea. Thrusting tip or no thrusting tip? So what else? Oh, I, I, I was asking, your, does your sword have a thrusting tip or no thrusting tip? Thrusting tip. I, but in the early tournaments, there was no thrusting. Um, these days, I mostly, I only use the thrusting tip really in wars. Um, we're in the press and, and I got it. But uh, I never really developed the habit of thrusting in tournaments. A lot of the period tournaments, thrusting was outlawed because um, as uh, George Patton pointed out, uh, thrusts are deadly. And that's when the U.S. Army went from a cutting saber to a thrust um, at Patton's uh, direction. The uh, you know, a thrust could actually kill somebody and you didn't want to kill them. You wanted to defeat them because in some terms, you could ransom their horse and armor and all that sort of thing. And it was a way to make money. And made a ton of money by doing that at tournaments. Um, we're really, uh, the way our tournaments are fought is actually more similar to, it really wasn't documented very well. It was fought by the bourgeoisie because as militia too, and tournaments were the big social and, and sports event of the you know, middle ages. And just as now, people in the middle classes aspired to that. So, so they would hold a kind of, and sometimes it was neighborhood melees, you know, one neighborhood against another. And those last East, the early 1800s um, in, um, I think in peace fighting, and some of the guys were wearing old armor and stuff, and they would fight with a, a, a club shield to the ridge. In fact, I think it was called a um, Giotto del Ponte. A, a, and so, and it was for neighborhood bragging rights and things. And there's some remnants of that in some of this day, but mostly it's done as a tourist thing now. But they were still doing it, you know, for or at least as late as 1810. So um, the kind of tournaments that we do where we find that's the kind of thing they were doing. Um, in, the, uh, in the high middle, they were mostly not fought on foot. You know, they were fought, they were fought on horseback. Um, there were lots of different types of tournaments. So um, most of us have read about them. I, I even so we uh the sources are out there and you can read about it's actually like and uh some of the kinds of fighting that we do were actually done by the um by the knightly class it was fought the kind of fighting we do on foot but what's more done I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I thought you cut out again. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite kind of tournament to fight in? Town tournament was my favorite. That was the, the cauldron of, 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 of everything. Um, you're having to fight at your fighting at their highest level. Uh, that was of all time fighting in fighting in crown tourney, but the physical and psychological preparation that it took, um, 
I mean, I, I, I won crowns over about a, a 20 year period, I think from like 1970 up until 92, maybe somewhere in there. So it was like 20 years. And uh, that's, it was just, it got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. It just physically, you know, not also financially, it's, it's become a huge burden to be king now. What would you do to psychologically prepare yourself for a crown? Ooh, that one, that one I've got to go. I, I, I went almost zen on it. Uh, I, I would, a matter of focus, medita meditation, essentially, that hadn't happened. The next fight hasn't happened. There is only this fight. The last, the next blow hasn't happened. There is only this blow. I would be completely in the moment. Still am. Resources that I had then. Um, and practice was for practice. In practice, I would work on my moves and so they were just in my muscle to think about them. When my opponent did, you know, if my A, I had the A prime or B or C response for that move, and I didn't have to think about it. Because anybody who's been fighting for a while knows this. If you, you have to think about what you're already half a beat behind your opponent, he's going to get you. So you've got to be able to respond. Now in practice, I don't have to do that. In practice, I can think about what I'm doing. I can try different things and see if they will look my opponent and see like if a guy has been getting me in, in, in practice, I'm like, okay, what are me? And then I look at it and think about it and go, oh yeah, I saw that before. I know what to do here. And just that in and, and start including it in my response So that, and uh, I do, I stay footed sometimes these days still, but uh, I still have some, uh, th that not having anything bother me. Having total focus has been, has, I've never lost that. And so it, um, um, it's a little bit faster than I think I actually am. So, because I see what my opponent's doing and the blow has already started, you know, without me thinking about it. I got a few silly tricks, you know, like if I'm, if it's a sunny day and I've got my, my opponent's shadow to see what they're doing, things like that. You know, I don't think anybody ever actually teaches is that it's just something I, and i tell my squires about it now um because you know sometimes that's really useful it's what it's doing without them being able to see that you're seeing them that can give you a huge advantage but you know there are art frame every little edge makes a difference if you're you know if the idea is to to have a really good fight, have a good fight um you can't always win but you can always to have a good fight. good fight. Go out there and do your best. And don't, uh, um, a couple of weeks ago about what to do if somebody wasn't counting blows. And some of me, you know, we're, well, hit the guy where he doesn't have armor and stuff. You know, I did that once. It was, but he wasn't, he was unarmored in a lot of places. And I could hit him at Will in the places where he wasn't just stopped and talked to him and said, "Look, man, yeah, you were you were over in Drakenval, and you were fighting in the army. Yeah, maybe you were fighting a certain way, but that's not the way we fight here in Ontario. You and that thing of hitting the guy where he didn't have armor. Um, thinking about it later, I thought it was painted.
So, you know, I always want to do, I, I want to have a good fight out there. Fight something uh, in practice. If it's a for fun tournament and there's nothing else to teach them at the tournament, you know, I go off to the side of the fight and say, wow, I really threw a really great shot there and you got me. Um, it's wonderful. How, how'd you think if I did that to them? I want to show them what I did to them. So I'm still learning the sport. Yeah, I, I think every, um, everyone's in that constant state of learning. Yeah. It's like playing guitar. There's no perfect ways to do it well, but there's no perfect way. Right. So. Interesting. Yeah, um, communication is key with the whole blow calling thing. Um, so why don't we go, mm -hmm. um, I have like the yeah. final 10 questions that I ask at the end. Um, so the first question okay, is, am I breaking up? No, I can hear you. Okay. If you could fight anyone in the world, who would it be? Broken up. Okay, try it again, because that time I didn't hear it. <laughs> if you could fight anyone in the world, who would it be? For some reason, the audio is cutting out. Yeah. So. <sighs> Maybe we just won't ask the last 10 questions. Oh, well, um, you can type them to me on chat. Okay. Do you go to Where'd it go? It went away. Can you see the chat? Went away for a minute. Like if I fight anyone in the world, who would who who would it be? Well, who? I yeah, who? <laughs> um, who would it be? Oh man. I would like to go and fight Jade again a lot. Because that way I could get. And also, I'd like to see him fight again. So, <laughs> yeah, that would be it. Other people I actually know. Um, for people like whoever was. Actually, I know who I'd love to fight. The, the, the guys over in the SCA group in Thailand, they look like they have so much fun. They remind me of the SCA back like 1975 or whatever. Right with those guys and work with them because um, they are so enthusiastic and they're having a blast. Maybe those guys. Yeah, they, they really are. Okay, I'm sending you the second question. So who would you like to see rain in your kingdom? Okay. Do you see it? Mm. One of my squires. One of my squires. Um, that would be cool. I would. That would make me. That would, um, right now, the Prince of the Summits is um, one of the knights of my lineage. So that's why one of my squires get out there and do it. If you could talk stick with anyone in the world for an hour, who would it be? And I just sent it to you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, because of the people I know, I actually do talk stick with them. So. For people that we both know, oh man, it'd be Luke. Okay. All right. I'm Luke sending Rizzo. you. He is, yeah, he really can, uh, he knows how to get, how to, so, and I've never really worked with him enough to learn it. All right. What is your favorite medieval-esque or period movie? 
Hmm. Alexander Nevsky, the old one. That was ended. It's it's actually pretty cool for the the time period they did it in. Cool. All right. The next question. So big wooden, big thick wooden swords. If you could add a rule to the rules of the list, what would it be? It would be to codify the practice that it, that it's become a, become a custom at this point, but I don't think it's actually in the rules to where the two are talked to by the marshal at the end of the fight and asked if they, and then it has to stick. If they say yes, that's it. Fights over, we're discussing it afterwards in terms of he didn't take my shot. I think that would end okay. a lot of this crap. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite tournament format? For pageantry, it's a pot of arms. Crown tournaments are crown tournaments and they have their, 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 their flow to them. But in terms of just beauty and honoring each other on the field, the pot of arm is really uh, our best thing. There isn't a lot of fighting often because you're, you're watching every fight. There aren't, mul aren't a lot of multiple fights going on at the same time, but it gives you a chance to really agree of what we do. And people who got serious about the pot of arm tournaments um, here starting 30, in 30 years ago, the, the way they ran them was beautiful. And the most memorable times that I had as a fighter was seeing those or being in them. It really engages the crowd too, which is great. What is your favorite event? These days I get to see old friends. Twelfth night too, though. I like twelfth night. If you could have any helmet, what kind would it be? I have it. <laughs> um, I loved Armes on horseback, so I made one, and uh, absolutely beautiful type of helmet. Uh, yeah, Armes are gorgeous. All right. I've got it's to wear Saturday, pretty helmets. It's Saturday morning at Australia and someone wants to talk to you about last night. What did you do? Well, I know exactly what I did. I was uh, wandering around with a bottle of scotch in my hand and badly and having a great time. So uh, yeah, and uh, some of my friends will attest to that. <laughs> All right. Who is your favorite fight oh, ever? Oh, geez. The best single fight that I ever had was a Crown Bell tricks that I lost. He and I met in the finals twice. I won the first one, he won the second. I won 14 years, went three fights and we were both in really good form. It's subtle. Um, we would we were we had each other's measure, and we would not make the right response so we could swing. And uh, I, I lost the third fight, but it was some of the best fighting I'd ever done, and it was it was really good. That was, that's my most memorable fight. I love it when people say it's a fight that they lost. Oh, you, know. you learn so much from, from those fights. That's, that's super cool. Yeah. 
Well, um, Your Grace, I'm sorry that we had some technical difficulties, but I, I, I heard most of what you said, so that's yeah. great. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this and talking to me. Um, it was super interesting and I loved fighting you last time. year and I hope I get another chance to fight you before you retire. Oh, you will, you will for five years out. I'm not gonna retire till then. I'm still in good shape. Um, amazingly enough, I'll be old in two years and uh, yet I'm still out there. However, for everybody, that's nothing. The Comte de Juan V answered the call to arms of the King of France in full arm of age. The King allowed and said, no, you've done enough and you can go home. So if, if I too, that would be kind of awesome. Now, he wasn't walking around in the armor. He was riding on a horse, but nevertheless, so. But I think I can make, you know, 72 pretty easily. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. And thanks so, everybody for joining us. So, yep. all right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.